So I think having insatiable curiosity, asking a lot of questions to dig into that truth that Kate was speaking about earlier is really the key to success for brands that travel and try and transcend from one culture to the other. You gotta pick yourself up, go backwards and slam yourself at the wall like 500 more times until the wall crumbles. 25% of middle school girls already believe they'll never achieve their dream career. Dream career. Dream career. Hi, I'm Kara Golden, founder and CEO of Hint. Hint. And you're Hint. listening to Unstoppable, a podcast spotlighting the journeys of inspiring entrepreneurs. I believe that at its core, leadership is about constantly learning from the people around you. And I'm so inspired by the conversations we're having in our upcoming episodes and can't wait to share them with you. This season, some of my guests include Rebecca Minkoff, fashion designer and founder of the Female Founder Collective, Diana Kaff, author of Girls Who Run the World, Andrew Dudham, founder of Hymns, and Eugene Rem, co-founder of Rumble Fitness, and much, much more. Plus, we ask the million dollar question, what does it really take to be unstoppable? Unstoppable. Let's find out. Hi, everybody. It's Kara from Unstoppable, and we're super, super excited to have Daniel and Kate here today. Yay. Hi, you guys. Hey, Kara. We're great and thrilled to be here. Very excited to have you guys here. So these two, this couple is are some of my favorites. They're with an amazing, amazing creative agency called Creative and Branding. I think creative is just too, too simple, too narrow. You guys are much more than that. But Mrs. and Mr., and you can find them on, at mrsandmr.com, but they are the creative agency behind some of the greatest design-led strategies of brands. They've worked with Sephora and SoulCycle and, God, so many, Rent the Runway, Google, who else? WeWork, Chobani. There's one other like drink that's out there, and I can't think of what it is. Oh, Hint! They did Hint! They did our whole redesign, which was, you know, when you're doing a redesign with founders in the room, it, it's a painful process, especially if you're a creative agency, I think. And so we worked hand in hand and they're just super awesome. And, and we have tons and tons of respect for not only who they are, but also what they got us to do. So amazing, amazing. So Kate has worked on both the client and agency side, originally from Melbourne, but then in London. And they've worked in this industry where less than 3% of creative directors are women. I did not know that. Very, very interesting. And the two of them obviously worked together. They founded this company, Daniel, originally from London and worked in some of the top agencies in London and in San Francisco. And became the youngest agency leader in the U.S. leading WPP's Berlin Cameron. Amazing, amazing. And then left to head up MDC's Red Scout. Very, very cool. But we had actually met through Julie at SoulCycle. And when I asked Julie one night when we were at a group dinner, like, who should I get that I didn't want to work with a large agency? I wanted to work with a small group. And she said, you have to talk to Kate and Daniel. And so I got their phone number and the rest is history. So very, very exciting. So welcome, you guys. Thank Thank you. you. Thank you for having us. We're excited to be here. Very excited. So take us back to the beginning. How did you guys decide to do this? And obviously, you guys were married before you started the company together. I love these like married couples that do companies together. So because Hint is as well. So of course, I think that's super great. We love that experience of when we went through the branding project together. We love that experience. It was so fun. The four of us working together, collaborating. It was great. It was was, was good fun. But our story actually goes back to before we were married because we were actually working in competing agencies. So even before, you know, we formed Mrs. and Mr., we were both in advertising, working in competing agencies. Yeah, I mean, it was was an interesting time. We met. uh, It was a coincidence that we were in the same industry. 
we were competing. We ended up competing for Amazon.com's business. It felt like a scene out of Mr. and Mrs. Smith, that movie where like they're both spies because we would have password protected laptops. We would stay in separate hotels. And it all became kind of farcical where we thought it might be better if we start working together. And I felt that if my career was going to go to the next level, I'd be better off partnering with Kate versus having Kate on the other side of me. So really, Mrs. and Mr. came about because we wanted to work together. We thought we had these really complementary skill sets and that we would succeed as a partnership as opposed to finding ourselves in different hotel rooms in different parts of the world. It wasn't making... Competing against each other. Yeah, exactly. competing against yeah. each other. And it also came about because we really believe that we wanted to have an agency where strategy and the messaging and creativity and design really came together in an integrated way. We didn't want one to play second fiddle to the other. So the idea behind Mrs. and Mr., beyond taking the tradition and flipping it, because Kate is very much in the driver's seat as the creative director, was really making sure that there was a symbiotic relationship between us that we could That's then awesome. offer to our clients. And Clinique was a founding client, and then we kind of took it from there. Yeah. So you're based in New York. And so what was the first work that you did for Clinique? So it was a campaign for Difference Maker. It was actually really interesting. It was um, it was interviewing around the globe women that are making a difference around the world. So it was sort of a global shoot. I was in Johannesburg and we were in London shooting and, and in New York as well. So that was our very first project together. And yeah, how long are we now? Uh, it's been like three years. Three years now. And yeah. then things kind of grew from that. It was helpful to have a, an anchor client in Clinique because they're an established brand. But then we were able to start working with other clients like Google and Sephora and things sort of grew from there. Which sort was of really quickly, but also just organically. We've been pretty rubbish at marketing ourselves. You know, I think this is probably the most we've talked about ourselves potentially on this podcast because what we've found is that just really, you know, we're driven by our client success. And then, you know, that's just like you said, you know, Julie told you about us and word of mouth and clients sort of like passing on our name has worked well. Yeah, for us, that was always really important. I think sometimes agencies will launch and they'll want like a big splashy press release around their launch. And we definitely had some editors reach out. They wanted to tell a story about us, but our point of view was always the brands that we work on are the ones that should shine. The founders and the entrepreneurs we're working with, we're in service of them. We want to build their brands and their profiles. So it was always very deliberate to almost be the secret weapon to the Julie Rices or hopefully now to the Carol Goldings and others, as opposed to being so focused on ourselves, we want to be focused on others. And nothing would be more rewarding than having our founder and CEO and CMO clients speak about us. That was much more valuable to us than having something in, you know, Fast Company or in uh, Adweek, even though that would, is good. We just felt that it wasn't as powerful as the voice of our own clients. And that was a deliberate strategy on our behalf to adopt that way of working. So it's interesting because I think a lot of the brands that I see that you've worked on have really been like there's stories to be told. And I know when we worked closely with you guys too, you know, that's why I hesitate when I call you guys a creative agency. I think you're much more than that. And I often feel like part of the problem with, you know, lots of different industries, whether it's, you know, business or whether it's government or whatever, it's like people are like sitting in these silos. And I think there's an intersection between brand and creative and storytelling. I mean, SoulCycle, you know, like it's just an example where you've got this passion, right? And this feeling and how do you get that across without beating people over the head? And I think Hint is the same way. I mean, you know, I think like so many of the brands that you've worked on are, you know, people smile over them, right? Like there's a feeling about them. How do you inject that into somebody's brand? I mean, I would imagine it's probably easier if like you do it from the start, right? Like, is it too late for a brand if they want to try and figure out how to do it later? Yeah, I don't think it's too, I don't think it's ever too late, but we are deliberate about working with brands and with products and services that we really do believe in and that without the branding, without the creative idea that surrounds it, where the product or the service in itself has a huge amount of integrity mm -hmm. and as value and is useful in people's lives. So we'll, you know, frankly, we will turn down opportunities. We just think we're putting a lipstick on a pig. We're not interested in doing that. So 
the greatest gift to us, frankly, is our clients' brands and their products and their services in themselves are so powerful that we get to build around that and we get to sort of do what we call product-led branding where it does start with the product. And not to make this about him, but him is a great example of that. The greatest gift about working with you and Theo and the whole team was you had a great product off of which we could build. Mm. You had something that we had nothing to do with that we shouldn't take no credit for. And that was for all our clients, that's very important that that baseline is there to build from. And so really you're just digging in and finding the truth, Mm -hmm. you know, and then it's our job to express that truth. And I think it's interesting you're saying at the start and, and, you know, are we a branding agency? Are we a communications agency? It's funny. I think it's been, it is hard to pinpoint. We even sometimes struggle with that because I think it is my training in Australia. um, They never siloed. It wasn't siloed at all. It was sort of very much like that Aussie kind of give it a go attitude at how I was trained. And, you know, the philosophy was if you could you know, come up with the idea and design it. You could then apply that to a logo, a film, a chair. It didn't matter, whatever the experience was. So, and it's funny, when I came to New York, sort of hustled my way into New York about 20 years ago, sometimes they'd look at my portfolio and they'd be like, oh, where do we fit you? We're not quite sure. Are you a packaging designer? Are you this? Are you, what are you? And it's funny, all these years later, now I think that really is a strength that, especially when we're communicating in such a holistic way with consumers. So to be able to sort of create these sorts of like very sort of like tight ecosystems around brands is something that I'm really sort of passionate about. You know, the consistency of voice and creating that story and world, complete world around a brand is something that I'm definitely, we're very passionate about. You know, both of you are not from the US and, but you've spent a lot of time in the US. Like if a brand is looking to go outside of the US, what things do you think that they should really be thinking about? I mean, obviously you worked with SoulCycle and WeWork and others that started here and then they went and did that. What are kind of the things that you think are really important? Like how do they differ? I mean, I think in in the case of Hint, we've thought about this. We're only based in the US, but people have always said the US is a tiny bit ahead of, you know, some other countries around diet sweeteners. And I think, you know, lots of countries are catching up now very, very quickly because of type 2 diabetes and heart disease and some of the other things. But people have kind of warned me that I think that this, you know, health thing that goes on in the US was not really necessarily like that prominent in other countries. But I guess it really would vary by categories. But how would you advise brands? It's a great question. I think one thing we try to do, what we, I guess we would advise, is to really understand the culture that you're going into, to sort of become almost like a cultural anthropologist, mm-hmm. where you take none of your preconceived notions about your market for granted, or just project what you know about, in this case, the US market, and try and project it to a different market. So I think having insatiable curiosity, asking a lot of questions, to dig into that truth that Kate was speaking about earlier is really the key to success for brands that travel and try and transcend from one culture to the other. And the best way to summarize how you do that is is really listening attentively. And I think because we're not American, in a way benefited from is because we came here without knowing Mm -hmm. the culture, all we had was this insatiable desire to understand the market we were in because we didn't take anything for granted. I didn't even understand the difference between a college and a university because I went to university. So I'm in these meetings where it's like, we got to speak to the college audience. I'm like, well, what's the college audience? So even naive things like that, where sometimes you could almost feel a little bit vulnerable because you didn't understand certain things about a culture. I think that's a real positive. What you don't know, you can turn into a strength if you decide to really go and learn and understand that culture. And once you do, you can connect to that culture in a meaningful way, just like you did here in the US or wherever a brand was incepted in the first place. I love that. And you put the story behind so many of these brands. Like, Do you think that that is critical? For brands like today? What do you see in terms of, you know, consumer response? I have an opinion about it, but of course, but I'd be really curious. I mean, does, should every brand have a story, I guess is the question. Yeah, I think people respond to stories, the way you speak, the language you tell needs to be compelling to people. I think storytelling comes from both using language, but also design mm-hmm. is a key 
part of that. People react to how you show up visually in the world, but storytelling is absolutely critical. And often, you know, when you work with founder-led brands, often the story comes from the vision, their story, the vision that they have for the brand. When a founder is not there, sometimes it's almost being like a brand archaeologist and with a, with a very established brand. You want to go back and get back to the soul of the brand. Why did it exist in the first place? Why did somebody come up with that product, that service back in the day? And how do we make it relevant again? But yeah, storytelling is key. Being able to craft a story, being able to tell that story in a way that is distinctive is also a key part of what we believe to be important. It's one thing to know the story, how you tell it, how you bring it to life is a, is a whole craft and skill set in itself. And Kate, do you think, like, what would you say is your design philosophy? I think for me, the craft is super important and it might sound simple, but like really digging in and, and going back to the roots of the craft. There's a great David Ogilvy quote that I love. Any idea can turn to dust or magic, depending on the talent that rubs up against it. So, you know, ideas, you know, are great, but how they're executed, they can live or die on the execution. So for me and our team, like craft is so in, important. And what I mean by that, is that, you know, digging in and finding the right, you know, obviously visual look and tone for the brand, something completely unique for that brand is really important. And, you know, I'm sort of like, I'm often dissatisfied. So, you know, I'll dig and I'll dig and I'll dig some more. And I like also to take, you know, I love to get away from the computer, get my hands messy. You know, we experiment in all mediums, you know, we'll sort of we'll paint, we'll silk screen, we will photocopy, we'll like to get that exact right shade of green or that exact like typography. For example, I mean, him was a great example. All the lettering in your brand system was actually cut by hand with scissors, you know, where and the, all those headlines and then scanned in and then rescanned to, to, for some, you know, to create more, more texture. So, yeah, I'm pretty relentless about sort of creating I love it. a really sort of unique visual world. And usually it's pretty sort of like tactile. And, and so, yeah, relentlessly crafting. That's what, it, what you know, I love to do. So we're recording this in hopefully the end of COVID, but maybe I'm too optimistic. But what do you see is like the key thing from a creative aspect that people are are thinking about? And, you know, what do you think is is kind of the vision for going forward? I mean, do you see people dramatically changing their brand in any way or their story? Or I'm constantly like thinking about this. I mean, I know just really quickly when we launched our direct to consumer or i should say through the gas on the direct to consumer business in march when we really saw you know frankly that we needed to figure out a way to kind of hedge against what we thought was happening with offices closing where we had a lot of distribution you know that for us was how do we put ourselves in the position of the consumer and i'm the consumer Right. And we wrote through our emails to consumers saying, hey, you know, like we get it. I mean, I'm scared when I go into stores right now. I'm not sure I'm supposed to be in there. Like I try and get out of there as fast as possible. And so I think actually for us, like that's not necessarily a long message, but I think it's not tone deaf to sort of what people are dealing with and what they're grappling with. And I think it's an important aspect. And I saw some of your brands that you guys have worked with do that as well, which I thought was good because I don't think you need to be gloom and doom, but I think telling people like we're all kind of challenged, you know, is okay, right? Like, what would you say to that? Yeah, what you're speaking to is, is insightful, which is one, being honest and truthful, empathizing with people, understanding you know, what they're going through, I think, at the moment is critical. And, you know, almost most importantly is, is taking meaningful action. I think brands that are doing things to be useful, to be helpful, as opposed to just talking about themselves, being useful right now is valuable. So when I see, this is an our client, but when I see Hilton Hotels, that is, they're going through a hard time. What are they doing? They made a lot of their hotels available to people on the front lines, you know, doctors and nurses, that's a very meaningful thing. They're doing that because it's the right thing to do. But that has a positive halo on their brand as well. And I think, you know, without getting into it, we've been doing a lot of that with our clients as well, which is what can we be doing that really adds value to people's lives? 
and shows that we care. And brands should be doing that anyway, to be honest. But I think right now, people need it more than anything else. And it's not just about writing a check for a million dollars or donating. It's what about your brand? What could you do? You know, when New Balance started making face masks before anybody else did, it became very popular and everybody piggybacked up with that. But they were among the first to do it. So yes, that to me is is key. At the same time, just to answer your question directly, at the same time, it's important for brands not to try and be something they're not. Consistency is still key. So there is a central story and a central message that I think can continue. But to your point, it's really about not being tone deaf. And doing is more important than talking right now. And the brands that do and the brands that put things out in the world that help, I think are the ones that will be remembered for having done the right thing during this pretty difficult time. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. I have a friend who just launched a pasta brand in London and I was talking to him. He, you know, is a brand new entrepreneur. He had been in inside of large companies for many, many years and he finally uh, he bought this company. It's an Italian pasta company that puts wild boar and some other things into pasta and all you have to do is basically put like, you know, the sauce on like any sauce. So it's sort of like the the soup Nazi of pasta where, you know, it doesn't matter what the sauce is like because the pasta is so great. And so anyway, great idea, COVID hit. And so I was talking to him. I was like, how is, you know, his name's Nicholas. I said, Nicholas, how's it going? And he said, well, I started thinking like the consumer and really started thinking, what are they missing? They're missing going out to restaurants. And so he said, I started talking about like all these restaurants around the area and how it was really difficult to do what he's doing during this time, you know, in restaurants. And so he literally like put this company together. He got his own trucks and started doing delivery before they were even kind of doing it in London. And I was just like, that's so awesome that you did it. And I mean, he really, and he said it was sending out emails to customers saying like, you know, that it's a scary time, very similar situation. But I think that consumers really respond to that. And I think it's such a critical thing to do. So I have this question that I always ask people, but what advice would you give your 20-year-old self? Both of you guys, what would you say? You didn't know each other back then. Well, marry well would be one of them for me, for sure. I feel like I achieved that one, so that's that's good. (laughs) That's given me a and an advantage. And what else? The advice I would give myself when I was 20 is definitely never let anyone undermine you or put you down. Like, you know, I think self-confidence and belief is absolutely critical. And if you can combine that with some semblance of talent and perseverance, you're going to do well, whatever field you're in, whatever you're interested in. So that to me is, is what I would tell myself. It probably is what I was telling myself at the time, but I just didn't know I was telling mm-hmm. myself that. Whereas now I can look back and say, yes, self-confidence, belief, talent, and surround yourself with amazing people, and you will have a good, a good life as a result of it, both in your personal life and also in your, in your professional life as well. I think that's true. A uh, similar sort of vein, I think for me, it would have been trust my instinct. I think it's taken me years to probably like come into that, you know, I maybe second guess myself in my 20s. In fact, I know I second guess myself in my 20s and just trust my instinct a little more, especially when it comes to work and the creativity that I'm doing, you know, so definitely that something else that I will never run out of ideas. I remember my mother saying to me once, are you ever worried you're going to run out of ideas? That's so funny. I don't know who you said that, mom, um, but no, you will not run out of ideas and just keep yourself inspired. You know, I've, I've sort of traveled a lot. I just sort of, I, I try and keep my eyes open, you know, like I think I was like that. I think I was like that then and I still am now. And I think always be useful, like always just try and be useful in whatever capacity, whether that's professionally, to a friend, to your family. Yeah, find use. Find you, Sam. I love that. Would you advise people that want to get into your line of work to go and work for an agency, like a bigger agency, or what's your sort of your thinking? Like, I, I people always ask me this because I, you know, my first job actually was at Time Magazine, and my dad had always. There's a crazy story in my book where 
I talk of, during a time when no one could get a job, I didn't get that memo. I was graduating from college and I was like, I just need to go get a job. You guys probably haven't even heard the story, but I ended up, it's a crazy pre-story that I won't bore you guys with, but I decided I wanted to leave Arizona and I wanted to go figure out where I was going to go. And I wasn't dead set other than it was going to be a big city. So I decided to buy a plane ticket one way to go from Phoenix to Los Angeles, to San Francisco, to Chicago, to Boston and New York. And along the way, I would tell people the story that I was interviewing and I was figuring out what I wanted to do with my life. And they were like, well, what do you think you want to do? And I said, I don't know. And I said, but I'm going to Chicago next. Do you know anyone? And so all these people kept giving me people. And so I had all kinds of interviews and I had over 90 interviews and I had 60 job offers when it was all done. And it was a great month of just exploring like who I wanted to be and what I wanted to do. And then ultimately, I ended up getting to Time Magazine, which is really where I want. I wanted to work for Fortune and they wouldn't hire me because I didn't have any experience. But I, so I took a job at Time just because it was in the same building. And I always shared the story with people. So I ended up getting in this job during a time that, you know, was not a time that I was supposed to be able to get a job. And it was just because I was curious and I was like, and at the end of the day, it was a brand. And so my dad had always said, like, go and work for a brand because like that'll like set you off on like the right place. But in addition to having a brand, there were all different people around me that were incredibly smart that I could learn from. Right. And, you know, I always had factors in there like I need to, you know, be learning and I want to work around smart people and they have to be kind, you know, like they can be tough, but they, you know, I have to be learning along the way. And I'm a big believer, even though I'm an entrepreneur, I'm a huge believer that nothing I've ever done was a waste of time. Like I learned about cultures. I learned about, I'm sure you did too, like what you wanted in your business, what you didn't want. And so that's what I always have shared with people. You know, even when they came to hint early on, I'm like, it's not a bad move to go work for a very large company for a while because you're going to learn what you do and don't want. And you're going to cherry pick out of those things. And I bet you guys feel the same way. Like it I couldn't agree more with everything that you just said. I mean, I know personally, I benefited a lot from having amazing mentors in Andy Berlin, from Berlin Cameron, Jonah Descent, from Red Scout. And as you say, you're learning about yourself when you're in your 20s and you're figuring out what works for you and what doesn't. And you're learning through osmosis. You know, I learned from amazing entrepreneurs probably before I had the confidence mm -hmm. to go out on my own. And if it wasn't that, sort of paving the way a little bit, it might have been hard for me to take that plunge with Kate. So I, I do agree. I benefited hugely from being in larger agencies and larger, larger organizations. And I also learned what I didn't want to bring in very adventure. So there's the pros, but there's also, you know, I believe in our case, like clients deserve access to the senior talent in the agency. And often in large agencies, the most senior people are not the ones necessarily doing the work. And I wanted to flip that on the head with Kate to make sure that our clients were getting access to us because I knew that in the large agency game, it doesn't quite work that way. So I encourage it for all the reasons you said, but it's a great opportunity for them to learn what they want, but also what they would do differently if and when they go off on their own. And, I, and that was always the filter that I, that I took during those formative years. Yeah. I agree. And I love your hustle story here. I have a similar one, you know, moving from Melbourne to, to New York that I just, I traveled to New York. I was supposed to stay a week. I stayed for six weeks instead on a friend's couch, which now as a New Yorker, I'm like, that's obnoxious. Someone's couch for six weeks. Um, but I, you know, I, I went back, I sold my car. I like saved as much money as I could and, you know, turned up with sort of like one way ticket without, sort of without a visa. I had to ship my portfolio over like ahead of time. And then you just have to hustle. You've got to work it out. So I think what you learn on the job is super important, but like 90, 90 interviews, that is phenomenal. I did not 
I did not have 90 interviews, but that hustle alone of getting in the right door and meeting with people, you learn so much about that process as well. So I think it's important. I really do. Yeah. Yeah. And I love your story too, that you guys were not born here, right? Because I think so often we put up, I mean, my book is Undaunted, Overcoming Doubts and Doubters. And so often I hear people talk when I'm out speaking about like, you know, how different I am from them because I obviously didn't have any failures. I didn't have any doubts. I didn't have, you know, any obstacles at all in, you know, doing what I'm doing today. And I'm like, wow, like what world were you living in? Cause that wasn't mine at all. Like I know you guys, you know, did as well, but I'm always like, I ended up saying two years ago at a conference that I, somebody had asked me, a form of this question. And I said, I think you actually need to break down why you think you can't do things. It has actually nothing, like it's a bigger kind of issue. Like I remember my niece was a pro soccer player and she ended up going to see, you know, somebody, a sports therapist who actually helped her get through things because she couldn't move in a certain way. And like, she didn't know why. And she kept saying, I just can't. And then she had a very smart coach who said, you actually need to see somebody about this and you guys need to like break it down. And it worked. And she played pro soccer like after that. And I think about that all the time where like, there's no reason why you can't do things if you actually like set your mind to it. And I I just think like you guys are such great examples of that too. And anyway, that's that's one of the reasons why I really wanted to have you guys on here too. I think it's really important. And the more we say... I can try and I can go do this and people hear your stories is that's where people find hope. Yeah. I really appreciate hearing that. And, and as an Aussie, like I just, as Aussie, I don't know whether, where it's from, but we really do have a give it a go attitude. You know, you re, I think as a culture, you know, where we're always willing to like roll up our sleeves and it doesn't matter what the job is. You just get in there and you get that shit done. You know, <laughs> it doesn't matter what. So, and it's funny you say that talking about this sort of, attitude because it's something that I know you know we have two kids and it's something that I really want to make sure I instill in them because I think it's so important not just in business but in life you just got to get on with it and I think you know having some an optimistic outlook and just that sort of like sense that like well hell yeah you know just give it a shot what's the worst that can happen so yeah it's something that that sort of yes it's definitely like an Aussie spirit thing that I I hope I've sort of you know brought across the pond with me we'll forgive you yeah, you married well. <laughs> On me, because I'm, you know, I'm actually half English, half French. So I've always been a little bit at war with myself. And uh, <laughs> having kind of this can-do spirit from Kate, where literally she will let, lo- will let nothing get in her way of achieving what she wants to achieve is, and I mean, this honestly is incredibly inspiring. And as she says, it is something that we do try to model for our children as well. We have a boy and a girl and, you know, equally we want them to have that belief that, you know, you can achieve what you want to achieve, but also it's just put one foot in front of the other, you know, just put one foot in front of the other. If you make it feel daunting, then it will feel daunting. But if you just break it down. You haven't even read my book yet. This is exactly what we're talking about. (laughs) So called Undaunted, but this is exactly it. So that's awesome. I'm going to quote my mother again. How do you eat an elephant? One mouthful at a time. I mean, it feels big and just one mouthful at a time and you get through it. And she's actually given me an elephant that I have sitting in my dressing room that I love. I love that. Yeah. (laughs) That's so great. So I think you guys answered our question, what makes you unstoppable? And I love, love, love like everything about this interview. So thank you guys so much. And people can find... You're both individuals on social, like you guys, in addition to Mrs. and Mr., where else can people find you? The main thing is our website. As I said, even on social, we've been so focused on building, you know, kind of our clients' brands that, again, it's been a deliberate thing, which is like, make it about our clients and not about us. But we do have, yes, our website with all of our information there. And we're just thrilled to be invited and to see you and to speak with you. Good to see you yeah. again. I hope it can be in the flesh. Super, room. super great to see you. So you guys, uh, when you're listening to this, definitely, if you like what you hear, definitely like the podcast and also subscribe. And we'll see you next time. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. 
you like what you heard, please help spread the word and leave us a review. You can also follow along with me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn at Kara Golden. Do you have a question for me or want to nominate an innovator to Spotlight? Please talk to me at Kara Golden on Twitter. Thanks so much for listening. Until next time, be unstoppable. Unstoppable. unstoppable.